I'd like to introduce the next panel, Designer Drugs and More, Biotech and You. Dr. Brent Schillinger will be leading the panel, and I'll hand it over to you, and you guys can see where I get all my mannerisms from. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriel. First of all, let's give a big hand to my son, Gabriel, who put this whole thing together. <laughs> Show him how proud we are of this project. Uh, my involvement, I know he's been doing this for the last two, three, four years, and I said I would come to the conference this year if I could be more than just an observer, that I need to be a participant. So he actually said, yeah, you can be a participant. So here we are now participating. We're gonna shift gears just a little bit. We're gonna talk about biotechnology in the tech sphere, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just define that. Biotechnology is the use of living organisms or products of living organisms for human benefit, to make a product, or to solve a problem. So, our esteemed guests and this panelist, Leopoldo Zambaletti. Leopoldo has 30 years of healthcare sector experience, led the JP Morgan European Healthcare Investment Team for eight years, went on to Credit Suisse in the same capacity. He's involved in many healthcare sectors, pharmaceutical, contract manufacturing, biotech, medtech. He worked extensively with private equity investing, extensive experience in mergers and acquisitions, equity financing, debt financing. I guess, what didn't he do? Then we have Claudio Giuliano, also very accomplished. He's a player in venture capital since 2000. Was associate director at the Carlyle Group in London, strategy consultant at Bain and Company in Italy, co-founder of Innogest Capital, which is the largest Italian early stage seed capital fund. And he's managing partner in their healthcare practice at Innogest. And uh, Innogest is involved in funding the first European incubator fully focused on cardiovascular innovation here in Europe. And uh, since the picture's worth a thousand words, I twisted Gabriel's arm to let me show just a couple of quick slides. So Leopoldo will, in, will uh, relate him to work that he does actually in the sustainable food space. Do we have that slide? Perhaps. <laughs> Somewhere. Technology. Okay, so just to show you the humor of the Brits, okay, uh, Meatless Farm, okay, why is everybody's face turning red? Uh, you've been director and manager of the latest funding round of this British company that makes vegan plant-based pea protein meats, and this is uh, their uh, advertising strategy. And to take it just a step further, the next slide, they actually the supplier for this other chain called... Next slide, Mother Cluckers, which is London's uh, fried chicken brand that has a range of recipes with the Meatless Farms alternative meat. So these slides, you're gonna remember Leopoldo. And for Claudio, we don't have anything quite as graphic, but they've been doing a lot of work in the cardiovascular space, so this is about as cardiovascular as you can get, and specifically a lot of work with, next slide, red cell, red blood cell delivery systems. So first question I have for you guys, uh, just tell me very briefly about a cutting edge development that you're actually a part of at this point in the biotech healthcare sphere. So start with Leo. Um, so currently, uh, the one that I would single, there are two I single out, but one that it's also easier to explain uh, for those of you that are not, uh, you know, biotech uh, is a company in Germany that has uh, developed a technology to be able to harvest uh, protein from the root of uh, tobacco. And why is this interesting? It's interesting because the uh, root of tobacco, once they harvest the tobacco, gets chucked, uh, and therefore there's no real use. Uh, and using the tobacco root enables for cell-free production of uh, protein. Uh, what that means is that you are able to distill uh, protein to a liquid form in 100 liters, 200 liters, 300 liters, making it extremely, um, not potent, but the level of yield that you have out of the product is uh, very high. Uh, you're able to uh, manufacture the liquid protein in uh, a couple of days, and uh, it allows biotech companies, pharma companies, companies in the ag, in the cosmetics, and whoever needs protein to be able just to add you know, the relevant DNA to a kit that gets shipped to them in order to obtain the protein that they require. Why is this interesting? It's because as the world moves more into the biotech space and, you know, less into the chemistry, but more into 
uh, the biotech, and therefore, as per the definition that was made at the beginning, the use of proteins is going to explode. Uh, and companies are having real trouble in finding uh, proteins uh, that they can use for either the clinical trials or otherwise, obviously, if it is non, if it is non uh, biotech, so in the food space, uh, and be able to scale it up uh, you know, very rapidly, very cheaply. So, so with this technology, you're able to actually produce proteins, DNA vaccines, et cetera, at a very in incredible scale compared yeah. to the current technology. Correct. Yeah. So Claudio, let me ask you to just uh, share with the audience in a layman's terms, uh, something exciting that you guys are working on. I know we talked about some things with the red blood cell technology. Yep, so uh, absolutely. We Maybe a couple of examples. One is this uh, red blood cell uh, company, uh, Eridel. Uh, it, it, it's really fascinating science and even more fascinating clinical uh, application because it uses red blood cell as uh, as uh, you know, myriads of internal laboratories inside the, the, the body to either be a catalyst uh, for, uh, you know, when, when uh, you, you d your body doesn't produce enough of a certain enzyme or uh, being a d an internal, uh, you know, very uh, natural uh, depository of uh, drug. Uh, that is the uh, most advanced study the company has in, is in a uh, uh, is in this ataxia telangiectasia, which is uh, you know a very uh, deadly disease, uh, inheritory uh, deadly disease, and uh, basically uh, you know you can cure with some drugs which uh, normally would have uh, incredibly uh, side effects, uh, so that you don't, cannot use for a long time, and these kids you know need for tens of years of course, for their lives. And, uh, you know, this technology uses uh, red blood cell to deliver in a very natural way uh, the, the drug that is needed in this particular case. And in perspective, uh, many other drugs for many other applications. So something that is really life saving. So you're actually able to take the uh, enzyme or the drug or whatever it is, inject it basically into a red blood cell. Correct. Not really injecting, but put it into the red blood cell and it can circulate through the body and avoid certain immune responses that might otherwise make the, uh, the chemical less effective. That's exactly it. So next question that I have, okay, for each of you fellows. What motivates you to spend your time in the biotech arena as opposed to less uh, directly human endeavors, you know, as opposed to the uh, blockchain technology or bitcoins or uh, luxury cars? What is it that attracts you to biotech? Um, so there are a few things. So the first one is, you know, the limitless uh, curiosity of human beings that is obviously always pushing the boundaries and always trying to find, you know, solution to problems which uh, today afflict, you know, all of us certainly, you know, from a health point of view. Um, so, you know, that resilience that they have, you know, for someone like me that, you know, suffers from uh, wanting to always be working on 20 different things, when I look at scientists and I work with scientists that have been slapped around for 25 years, you know, with a firm belief of being able to, you know, find, you know, why is it that that mechanism of action that they have studied at university and that grabbed their curiosity is ultimately going to work, and despite, you know, all the odds are against them, they just bounce back like those little football players in that, you know, game that you used to play as a kid, Subutio. And, you know, that ability to keep on going, uh, for me, is, you know, it's, it's fascinating. So it's a combination of, you know, that curiosity, the, uh, the resilience, and then obviously that, you know, in my time, I've been, as you said, you know, 30 years doing healthcare. I mean, what I have seen in terms of improvements uh, in, uh, therapy, medical device, diagnostics has been significant. And I can only imagine uh, seeing what's happening today in biotech that the next 20, 30 years are going to be absolutely revolutionary. So Claudio, your particular attraction to this sector? <laughs> yeah, it's very similar. It's the science, first of all. You know, I'm an engineer by training. So sometimes I'm frustrated because I'm with biologists and physicians who know so much more than me. But the science is fundamentally uh, fascinating. and. Uh, there is a sense of purpose because that science is applied to, you know, helping people in uh, real terms. And then, you know, I do it from a perspective of an investor. And there is, uh, there are very few industries out there that are so resilient and constantly growing, like 
you know, the, the healthcare industry. Absolutely. So we want to shift the focus just a little bit. So move it up to the next slide. I think it's two slides ahead. And the next slide. So if you can see the caption, for those of you halfway back to the room that can't see it without squinting, you could turn around and look at it. It's, it's something as clinicians that we have to deal with, particularly in the US. So you see it's a uh, patient at the pharmacy counter picking up her medication. He's holding this out as if it's a gun, and he says, your money or your life. So that raises the question. You know, clearly investment in all this is driven by wanting to do good things, also driven by wanting to make profit. So how do we balance making money with making the products affordable for those who might not live without them? It's, it's a tricky question, but you're the guys well, who I, have the answers. Well, I, I think you've got to decouple the question because regionally there is such a big difference between the US and Europe, right? So I think that you know, the European market clearly has a much more you know, balanced approach to the economics of uh, healthcare and a much more diligent approach to it, meaning that you know, you've got entities uh, you know, like NICE in the UK that uh, if they, you know, they look at the data of a drug and if the drug is clearly not differentiated from another drug that costs you know, half as much, they will just not approve it. And you know, the advocacy groups might uh, kick and scream, but ultimately, you know, they, they, they take a very, very, uh, I think, fair, you know, stance when it comes to uh, the pharmacoeconomics. Um, so, I think Europe, to a certain extent, the problem is, you know, solved because uh, the expense is obviously much lower. In the US, we were just discussing this during the break before, I think the issue is that, you know, you've got too many layers of people that are skimming off uh, and therefore, you know, the, the criticism is always pointed towards the pharmaceutical companies that defend themselves by saying, well, you know, if we don't have these profits, we're not able to invest in research. There's a certain element of that, uh, which I think is, is justifiable. Uh, but the truth is that between the end consumer and the pharmaceutical companies, you've got a lot of actors in between that, you know, uh, shouldn't really be there, uh, and uh, and that I think that ultimately create you know a bad reputation for the sector, and and in the end cripple budgets, uh, and and create a significant disparity from a social point of view also. So with this in mind, how much of your business slash profits would you say are based in the U.S.? Uh, the system in Europe seems to as you suggest, make a lot more sense, but do you rely on the system in the US for, your, for what you develop to actually make a sustainable profit? Uh, Claudia? Yeah, that, 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 that is correct. Uh, usually the, the US market is, uh, is larger, I mean, of course easier to penetrate because it's one single, real single market with a single regulation um, checkpoint and so on. But I have, I have to say, so, so, so uh, usually, you know, uh, for, for any given solution, maybe one fourth of the market is Europe. Uh, you know, uh, half of the market is, is US. So you, FDA getting to that market is very, is very important. Now I have to say that uh, you know, of course, that uh, the slide is about a US pharmacy, uh, not a European one. Uh, the but, but I, I have to I have to be honest. I mean, uh, as an investor, we also ask himself some ethical questions. You know, you see like. Prices of drugs, you know, used to be dollars. Then there have been tens of tens, hundreds, thousands. Uh, that you, have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a single uh, drug, which is on the other side life-changing. You no, know, solves let's say the genetic therapies that can solve with one shot, you know, uh, a, a, a deadly disease that otherwise would, uh, would would have no cure at all. But I have to say, constantly, I've been surprised by how much the industry, both the pharmaceutical industry pushed by the regulators and the payers, have been uh, uh, pushing towards more and more. Uh, pharmaco and care economical uh, uh, you know solutions that are that are sensible there. So the truth is there is more expense. There are there are a larger amount of GDP spent on healthcare, but the the, the level of uh, therapies and the healthcare is, has improved enormously. Even the U.S. I mean they al always criticize the U.S. And, and for for a number of things. I, mean, I was surprised to see a, 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 
you know, it's well known that uh, life's, li life expectancy in Europe is, is longer than in the US. Yes. But as a matter of fact, if you get to 80, the life expectancy of an 80 years old person in the US is much longer than, than, than w w a European one. That, uh, that was a, a New England uh, Journal of Medicine article uh, recently published, which means that, uh, granted if you are a white and male and uh, you have money, but uh, the level of healthcare, qu the quality of healthcare in the US, it's, it's astonishing high. Sure, but the question becomes again, you know, at what expense? You, know, you refer to ethical values in medical ethics. I'm involved in teaching that. Uh, we have different tenets. One of them, of course, is benevolence to do good by your patients, non malevolence to do no harm. But there's also something called justice, medical justice, which is to allow access to what's available. And because of the economics and the finances, oftentimes that access is not available. Now, you guys are involved in raising money, developing products, trying to make a profit. What happens though in the case of you're having a bad year, you don't have any money left that year. You have a child who's diagnosed with some rare form of cancer that can be treated by this drug that costs $800,000, which is not fiction. This is how it works. I mean, what do you do about that? We have, um, you know, very poor individuals, indigent in the US, they get access to this. Wealthy people, they complain, but they'll write the check out for it. But it's the people in the middle, guys who are working two or three jobs to make ends meet, they can't afford the health insurance, and then they're told they don't qualify for a program to get a hold of this drug. How do we strike an ethical balance there? Any thoughts on that? Ooh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, Look, I, for me, I don't have an answer to your question. I mean, I think, you know, as a European, and if I look at the level of access that we have, be it here in Spain, in the UK, to free healthcare, uh, you know, for us is unthinkable, you know, that, this, that the US, you know, has a, such a situation. And I, I, I think in the end, you know, it, it requires a massive overhaul of the whole system, which is what we were saying before, you know, you gotta cut out the PBMs, you know, you, you have to just go through every single actor within the system and, and you know, and, and effectively, you know, take out uh, certain profit centers that have no reason to exist. It is a huge political gamble for any president, any member of Congress, you know, to endorse something like that because PBMs employ I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people. And, uh, and, and PBM stands for Pharmacy Benefit, Benefit Management, Management, an entity that was created several years ago. It's already like a $50 billion a year industry. We could have a whole weekend seminar just on that topic. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of people in the healthcare system would agree this is something that really needs serious reform. But with the kind of money they're talking about and the way our Congress operates, I don't see yeah. this changing anytime real soon. But again, it goes back to how much are the profits in the projects that you guys work with and the uh, motivation that you need for your investors, how much of that would be changed if all these reforms occurred in the US? Uh, significantly, I, I, would, I would think. Um, I think that there is, there are two things. On the one hand, because it's such a profitable market, uh, companies, and Claudio is, you know, has seen it probably more than me, you know, the level of uh, complacency that there is in uh, spending money for U.S. companies is huge. Uh, you know, the same activity that a U.S. biotech does with 100, a European company does with 30. And that's just by virtue of the fact that capital is much tougher, you know, to get mm -hmm. in Europe uh, at valuations which tend to be around 45% inferior to those in the U.S. So, you know, it, the impact would obviously be, you know, much greater. But when you see, you know, a Pfizer that has 50 percent uh, EBDA margins, you know, so the, the level of profitability is so high, you've got to think that there is obviously room for maneuver. And two quick I, examples yeah. there. Okay, look at Gilead, yeah. look at AbbVie. So Gilead, you know, they acquired a company and you're in, in the business of a lot of the startups and you want somebody to acquire you. So they acquired uh, Pharmacet yep. and the drug Solvaldi back in 2011. A bill, $11 billion they paid. So that's probably a nice profit for the startup. Mm -hmm. Okay, but Gilead, at charging something like $100,000 for the 12 week dose, made it all back in nine months. And that was 11 years ago. Yep. They're still selling this drug at something like 50 to $80,000 yep. per patient. How is that ethical? Look at Humira. 
Humira, which is the largest grossing drug in the world, except last year the Moderna a vaccine made a few dollars more than, than Humira. I'm a dermatologist. Humira were used for psoriasis. When it came out in 2012, they were charging something like 15 grand a year. When the rep came in to meet with me, I said, I think, she goes, what do you think about this, Dr. Shung? I said, you guys should be locked up because, you know, we were sensitive to $200 a month drugs. Their drug was $1,200 a month. Today, 12 years later, Humira is going for $80,000 a year. I mean, how is that ethical that they can, again, the profits become so huge? Listen, we, we, I guess no one has the answer on how, on how to solve this. I mean, Europe has solved this at the end of the day. I mean, the, the, the budget is under control. There's about half, I guess, uh, GDP-wise, we respect the U.S. I don't think the quality is half of that, the U.S. It's maybe 10%, 20% lower. Um, but I have to say, I mean, as an investor, uh, you see the cases of success. So, you know, that company is acquired for one billion. Great for them. But how many companies do not get acquired? I mean, FDA, EMA, FDA especially, I mean, it's so tough. And rightly so. They have to be tough. But for instance, Eridel is in this job of, tr of, of clinical uh, uh, development for, for 10 years. I mean, 10 years sure. we have been waiting and investing and risking money, and of course you're not sure until the very end whether sure. anything is going to, to, to end up successful. In the but case but of to that effect, a lot in our country, in the U.S. at least, a lot of the original research is actually government funded and IH yeah, funded, right. okay. and then when you get to the next level, it's challenging for you guys, but when you get to the next level with the billion dollar companies, they influence Congress. There was a big article in the New York Times just three weeks ago yeah. that basically they fast track all their drugs so the little guys don't stand much of a chance. You know, Their drugs get through really quick, the efficacy is not necessarily that high, the safety oftentimes not tested. But I like your suggestion, we need to learn from the European system. One quick question on top of this. US is only one of two countries in the world that has direct to consumer advertising for pharmaceutical products. You think this is good for patients at all? It's certainly good for profits for the industry. Look, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, whenever I'm in the US, you know, you turn on the TV, I mean, it is ludicrous. It's crazy. Right? I mean, and in the end, are you as a consumer going to really be looking at that ad? I mean, presumably, if you have some sort of Obviously, pathology, you will be looking at it and saying, actually, I've got to remember to t talk to my physician. But is it that necessary, this bombardment? I mean, yet again, you know, it's, just, it's another way for the system to justify economics that ultimately, because, you know, if you take out the uh, advertising budget of an Abvi or a BMS or a Novartis, you know, I mean, the amount of money that gets spent, I think, you know, Europe does it better in healthcare, for sure. Uh, the one thing that we don't do better is that we don't have as much specialist capital that comes into it. Sure. Uh, but when we look at the statistics of Europe versus the US, you know, we publish, Europe publishes double the amount of publications, of scientific publications, uh, despite having 45% less uh, money and actually having a return on investment, which tends to be around 50% better than in the US. And I'll tell you though, as a clinician, what I see in terms of the direct-to-consumer advertising, every day patients come in, oh, can you give me that new drug I saw advertised on television? Oh, we have okay. some new topical things for psoriasis, okay, which retail for about $1,800 a tube that do marginally better what Triumcin alone does and costs $5. Okay, so they're coming in asking for it. So us old guys who've been working for maybe too long tend to be a bit cynical and say, I can give you something simpler, but they go after the young doctors, they go after the physician's assistants and nurse practitioners who don't have the experience and they're writing the prescriptions for this. So they see it as a very good investment. And one more note on that, social networking. And we could again have a whole weekend conference on that. And we talked a lot about that earlier this morning, the power of the internet and social networking and what's gonna happen in the next 10 to 20 years. There's a lot of controversy in the way that they are now doing direct-to-consumer marketing yeah, yeah. pharmaceuticals. Okay, I know we went over, do we have time for one question from the floor? Two questions, Two questions. okay, says the boss. <laughs> Any hands up? They don't like biotech. <laughs> okay, there's a question. Hi, so, so we've been talking about profits, right? Uh, but could it be progressive pricing a solution? Right, it's, profit will still be there for whoever can pay for the profit, but then it gets a little bit diluted for people who cannot pay for the price. 
You don't even, you don't even need to tax people progressively, you just give direct to consumer progressive pricing. Progressive pricing of the products, your thoughts? I, look, I, I think uh, I couldn't agree more. I don't see any reason why, you know, if you want to have a system that is fair, uh, because, you know, we, we can talk about, you know, disparities everywhere, right? I mean, we, we see it in every sector across the board. I mean, it, it is, it's a reality, and that's why it gives rise to nationalism, etc. And I do think that, you know, any mechanism that, uh, that is more geared towards being able to push uh, consumers, you know, to pay for what they can afford in the same manner that it happens here, for example, with universities and, you know, in other situations, it's, it's definitely, a, you know, a very good solution. Now, I have not seen, I mean, I've seen it mentioned, but uh, has it ever been a proper topic that has been tabled uh, from a regulatory point of view? No, not really. But ultimately, somebody still has to pay for it. So if you have this progressive pricing and it's a government-funded program, you'll figure out a way for the government to be paying these high prices. So part of it, you know, it's again, it's striking but a balance. It's, yeah, it's, you know, you need profits, we need that to drive the industry, but we need some type of regulation so it doesn't become, like in the case of Gilead or AbbVie, some of the things that they're yeah. doing. I would say, my judgment, a bit obscene. Yeah, yeah, of course. But, you know, I think that the point of the governments, you know, if you look at the situation of Pfizer and, the, the, you know, the U.S. government giving two and a half billion, uh, for COVID, which was the right thing to do to spur on, you know, but, you know, how is it that nobody that was signing that contract with Pfizer at the government level decided that actually you're going to have to pay us back? I mean, that two and a half billion were gone and they made 24 billion, 25 billion in even revenue more, for more than the COVID happy. vaccine or even more so. And the government uh -huh. sits there, you know, I, so, so the inefficiencies in the sector are... A lot of moving parts you know, that yeah. we need to look at. Yeah. We had one more question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, actually, I wanted I wanted to ask uh, because we, we talked about profits. Yes, we talked about uh, also Claudio was mentioning um, about the the FDA and the process of approval. So, as an investor in a space like biotech, and how do you actually manage to mitigate your risk of the investments that you're making when it's even millions of dollars uh, not being approved or or you know, taking 20 years to see a return, and how do you actually? Well, what's what's your uh, mitigation of risk in that sense as an investor? Mm. Well, well, I have to say that uh, I I sometimes you know uh, startups perceive the FDA and the regulators as a as a threat, as a you know, but, but they are actually friends because they are the ones that uh, allow the, the quality product to emerge versus everyone else. Now, uh, it. it it's hard to answer in, in, in a few minutes, but uh, I have to say that generally speaking, the FDA uh, and, other, and other regulators have uh, more and more um, made uh, programs for early discussion with, uh, with companies, like there is this uh, early feasibility study program whereby you can go to people that will be not judging you from an FDA standpoint and say, hey, how will you do that? And so doing that, doing it proactively, not having fear of, of the regulators, but working as early as possible uh, with the regulator, I think it's one of the ways. Great. So thank you so much. Thank you. Leopoldo, Claudio, thank you so much for being part of this uh, thank you. passionate discussion. Thank you. Thanks.